Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here. Were it not for grace, were it not for Jesus, were it not for the Holy Spirit, were it not for you, Heavenly Father, calling, drawing, transporting us here by your grace, were it not for you, we would not be here. And we thank you, we praise your name, and we ask for your blessing as now we look to your word to learn something more about this special symbol, this special way of remembering the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Open our minds as we study together this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> some of you, <clears throat> some of you may be old enough to remember the historic tearing down of the wall. Perhaps you even remember listening to our president, Ronald Reagan, standing there at the podium in front of the Berlin Wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Banners spread across Eastern Europe. Voices joined together, growing stronger and stronger, conf more confident with each step. I remember Lech Walesa in Poland. I remember that just as a kid. Wow, solidarity, what is that? Voices of Polish workers, Hungarian students, Czechoslovakian dissidents, East German youth, Romanian shopkeepers, and the chorus rises together, all energized by one magical, powerful word, freedom. In the last few months of the 1980s, 1980s, the world watched spellbound as decades of totalitarian rule toppled before an incredible human wave of freedom. Future historians will look back on 1989 as one of the pivotal points of history, ushering in a new era for Eastern Europe, and as a result for the world. People all over the world seem to be celebrating the triumph of freedom in the most unexpected places. See, we're living in exciting times. What most observers failed to see, though, was that there was a, a spiritual dimension to these revolutions against tyranny. See, much more was happening than just a revolt against a political system. That, that did happen, but there was more. In most of the countries that struggled under various forms of dictatorship, reformers found a source of strength and inspiration in their spiritual longings. They gathered in cathedrals and chapels to fan the flames of freedom. Worship services united believers in their stand against tyranny. Those of us who've lived all of our lives in relative security, or at least most of our lives, relative security and freedom, we find it hard to grasp how priceless such things are. We may have forgotten how deeply God himself is committed to freedom. The book of Revelation in the Bible describes this titanic struggle, and we've talked about this over this series, this struggle between good and evil. The forces of good, the forces of evil between the dragon and the lamb. You know, between our arch enemy, Satan, the deceiver, formerly known as Lucifer, and Jesus Christ, the Archangel Michael, our Savior and Redeemer. Revelation reveals a God of incredible love who never forces... See, friends, I think this is one of the keys of this whole conflict between good and evil is freedom to choose. The devil doesn't want you to have freedom. He will take you by the scruff of the ear neck and make you. God says, no, I will let you choose. That's the great, that, that's the amazing thing. We studied this when we talked about God's final justice. His amazing willingness to, to give people what they want. Works and works as long as he can, but ultimately gives them what they want. Revelation reveals a God of incredible love who never 
forces our allegiance or coerces our will. Throughout the book of Revelation, he invites us to come to him freely. Look at what he says. Whoever will, Revelation 22, 17, let him take the water of life. What does it say? Freely, freely. But friends, the amazing truth is, not everyone wants to be free. Not everyone wants to be free. And certainly, there is someone who doesn't want you and me to be free. The dragon is hell-bent on destroying God's faithful people. Revelation reveals his vicious attacks on believers at the end of time. Look at how Revelation describes this. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went off to do what? To make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. See, there's, there's this parenthetical description of God's people, but the real thrust of this is to tell us that the dragon is our enemy. He's out to get you. God's calling out a people to be faithful to Him, calling them to lovingly keep His commandments, and He invites them to publicly declare their loyalty. But you may ask, well, how, how do we take a stand? How do we declare our allegiance? Look at what Revelation says. To Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And made us kings and priests to his God and Father to him. Be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, you might ask, does God have a visible symbol that we are washed in the blood of Christ? You may be familiar with this. He most certainly does. Baptism, friends, is a symbol of our commitment, our loyalty and allegiance to Jesus Christ. You know, it's as though the cross is always behind every baptism. See, here's what Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. Baptizing. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them, Jesus says, you make them disciples, you baptize them, and teach them to observe, to obey, to follow all the things I've commanded you. Remember, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, there's a connection there. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Revelation invites us to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. But you might ask, well, what does that mean? Do you know that baptism is mentioned more than 80 times in the New Testament? It is a symbol, it's the visible sign, the public expression of, that we're washed, we're cleansed, we're renewed in the blood of Christ. Yet many Christians are understandably confused over this basic Bible ordinance. Now, how many kinds of Bible baptism are there? How many kinds are there? Now, is, what about sprinkling babies? Is that a Bible baptism? Or maybe, maybe you've heard of, of water poured over the head of a young child or a baby. Uh, in some denominations, there are some believers baptized with olive oil. And uh, there's even, uh, I've even heard of a church that's sprinkled with rose petals. Different ways of baptism. Here's one example. One pastor, I think this was a youth pastor, took his youth out into the mountains in the snow, had them lay in the snow and covered them with snow, and uh, that was their baptism. It's, it's water, after all, right? But really, how many methods of baptism are there? See, look at what if Paul says in Ephesians 4 or 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And friends, as we go through this, this presentation this evening, one of the questions, undoubtedly, that's going to come to your mind is, is uh, Mark, why are you making such a big deal about this? And stay with us, because we'll see that there is a symbolic significance to the very method for how we're baptized. When we think of one baptism, now where would we look for a method of baptism that we could really trust? Where would we look? Wouldn't you agree that if we look to the example of Jesus, that would be a safe thing to put our trust in? 
Well, how was Jesus baptized? Think of here's John. Here he is at the river. He looks up, sees Jesus coming. John Mark records it in his gospel. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan, the Jordan River. Our friend uh, Rod, who's not with us this evening, but has uh, sat at Shirley's table. He's actually been to the Jordan River. He's been there. Yeah. Yeah. Been there. In, and, I was going to be baptized there, but we didn't have time. Oh, what, a, what, a, what a powerful experience that would be. Yeah. yeah. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. John's Gospel recording this same practice of John the Baptist. Well, here at the Jordan River, you, why did they have to go to this place for much water? <clears throat> so sprinkling and pouring don't require a lot of water, but it, baptism by immersion does. You have to have enough water to get the person under. When Jesus was baptized, he went down into the water and back, came back out, out of the water. He was fully immersed in the water. And this was a significant event in his life. And our baptism, when we're baptized, or if you have not been baptized, you're looking forward to that, it's a very significant event in your life. In the life of Jesus, two things, special things happened to him at his baptism. The Bible describes it this way. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. Some trend, and one God says it, heaven was torn open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. First, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus to give him supernatural spiritual power to face the temptations of the evil one. Remember, right after his baptism, he goes into the desert and for, after 40 days of fasting and praying, then the devil tempts him. The Bible promises that when we're baptized, we also receive spiritual power. Wouldn't you like that? I, I need that in my life. It came upon Jesus. It will also come upon us. He received power at his baptism. And as we, by faith, open our hearts to him, we receive the Holy Spirit at our baptism. See, some people wait. They, they want to wait until they feel good enough to be baptized. But friends, we're not baptized because we're good enough. But as an acknowledgement that we are sinners, we're weak sinners, we need His cleansing power. And the Scripture says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And that's the experience, that's the experience that, we, that we understand. That's what happens when a person is baptized. Now... Look at one of the earliest pieces of art depicting Jesus as he's baptized. One of the earliest artistic renderings of this event. Look at this. This is a fresco that was found in the 4th century, so 400 years to Christ, in Africa portraying Christ's baptism as by full immersion. When Christ was baptized, there was a second thing that happened. Remember that the Father spoke, and here's what he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Every time, as a child of God, every time we call, we respond to the call of Christ, we're baptized, we take a public stand, we take a, you know, we, we step out and publicly declare our allegiance to God. The Lord in heaven is pleased. When we're baptized, once again the Father says to you, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. In you, in him, I am well pleased. So believers down through the centuries have experienced this same joy of making a full commitment to Christ through baptism. Sometimes they're the only members of their family to do so. Maybe the only member of their city or village or tribe. God calls us individually. See, the call goes out to the group, but it's to the individual. 
Look at what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch. Perhaps you remember this story as he was reading the scripture, actually the book, the uh, passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 53. God miraculously led Philip to join him. Philip explains to him what the prophet means, answered his questions, and he made a strong appeal for this man to completely dedicate his life to Christ. The Ethiopian was thrilled. Thrilled with this new relationship with Jesus. He wanted to be baptized. And his request is found here in the book of Acts. As they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, see here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Or another translation says, what prevents me? Or as we would say today, why can't I be baptized? I believe in Jesus. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down, notice, into the water, and he baptized him. And now when they came up out of the water, and the narrative goes on to describe what happened, but let's pause there for just a moment we see some truths about baptism. The Ethiopian accepted Jesus Christ. His baptism indicated he was taking a public stand. The Ethiopian and Philip. Now I've heard of some pastors that have, in, in some cases, in some countries where baptism wasn't legal and they were baptizing in a bathtub, the pastor wasn't even in the water. But if you have enough water... And I can tell you from experience, when you bat, when when a person when I'm baptized, when I baptize someone, you get wet. <laughs> you do. They both went down into the water. The Ethiopian was fully immersed. Is a, a kind of a funny story. The gentleman who was baptized in a church not too long ago, not too far from here, and uh, the gentleman that was baptizing him baptized him, but his head didn't quite go into the water all the way. And so someone noticed that and said, and he, in fact, I think it was, a, it was the man himself, and he said, no, 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 I, I have to, so he had to go again to get all the way, get all the way under. And we smile about that, but it's significant, friends, it's really significant. The whole person has to be immersed because the whole person is a sinner. Every part of us goes under the water because every part of us is sin. At least that's my life. Every part of us goes under the water. Every part of us is sin. We need a lot more than just, I need more than a sprinkle. I need more than just a little pouring. I need to be wet all the way. After all, the, the Greek word for baptize, baptizo, this is what it means. To dip, to immerse in the water. To plunge under the water. Here, here's how they would use this word. If a woman was going to dye some cloth, change the color. I did this one time, didn't work very well. <laughs> Had some pants that I thought I would change the color. They turned out kind of a yellow. It, it <laughs> never wore those pants again. <laughs> but if you were going to dye a cloth, in Greek you would say you would, it would be baptizo. You would baptizo it. Or... If a clay pot is going to be plunged into the water to draw out some water, fully submerged, baptizo, same word. And friends, archaeology reveals baptismal sites in our Christian church in the early years after the apostles. Look what we find. Ancient churches reveal this same method of baptism. Here is the first century church in Philippi. Look at this uh, this, this remains of the baptistry. It's big. Look at that. Lots of room there. Get all the way under the water. Here is the St. John of Lateran. is the second largest church in Rome. Most famous church in Rome after St. Peter's Cathedral. Now if you walk through the narrow alley, they tell me. I haven't been here myself. But if you walk through a narrow alley to the back of the church, you discover something quite remarkable. A beautiful baptistry. In fact, organized Christian church, our organized Christian church, 
practiced baptism by immersion as late as the 13th century. Baptistries in these ancient churches reveal that Christians were practicing baptism by immersion for hundreds and hundreds of years. Or actually at over a thousand years. If you're familiar with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, maybe you've also heard of another tower, not quite as tall, which also is leaning, and it's famous for that. It's called the Bell Tower. But you may not know that the Bell Tower, there's a baptistry right behind the tower where early Christians practiced baptism by immersion for centuries. But even more fascinating, one of the most remarkable baptistries in the world is found in Cappadocia, a city of refuge deep within the caves of southeast Turkey, where Christians found refuge from their oppressors in the dark Middle Ages. Remember the Middle Ages where our Christian church went wrong and our own Christian church was oppressing Christians, Christians who wanted to stay true to the Bible. And here they're taking refuge in Turkey. So if you were to go there... You go through the door, I don't know if you can see that down here close to the bottom, there's a door carved into the rock in this secret city of refuge, this place of worship. You would find a baptistry carved in the rock. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this picture is a little bit dark, but if you were, if we could light this up a little bit more, you would see right behind his feet, there is a hollowed out space in the ground so that tall people could get all the way under the water. I mean, if you look at this, this spout, the, the dark spot right be above the gentleman who's uh, posing as the pastor, that's the spot where the water came in. So the water would raise all the way up so that, I mean, it'd be full. And there's this hollowed out space right behind his feet so that if there's a taller person, he could stand in that and he would be able to be fully immersed. Early church practiced baptism by immersion. Believers through the centuries have followed this biblical practice, but that's not the only place. Look at this. St. Vladimir's Cathedral in Kiev. You have a picture of the first ruler of Russia in 1000 AD. Here's a picture. Here's this in the cathedral. Here's the baptism of Russian King Vladimir the Great. Baptized by immersion. In fact, it wasn't until the Council of Ravenna in 1311 that sprinkling and pouring were began to be accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. See, this is what happens. Our Christian church in the Middle Ages started to include some other practices that aren't found in the Bible. And uh, this, is, this is what, as Christians, this is what we have to come to terms with. This is what, and this is, and the reason I stress this, friends, is because this can happen today in any church. If we allow people, traditions, what's convenient, anything else, to come in place of what it, God says here in His Word, we'll run into problems. Friends, I believe that along with some of the other practices that we've talked about, some of the other ideas... That God is calling us back away from those practices that aren't based in the Bible, calling us back to the Bible and back to the Bible's description of baptism. What is the meaning of Bible baptism? See, why is it so significant? Look what Paul says. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, did Jesus just kind of experience a little pain and then go on? You know, uh, I understand that in the Quran, it says that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. See, this is where the Bible and the Quran can't both be true. One of them is true, because they say opposite things. One says that Jesus actually died there on the cross. The other says, no, it just appeared that he did. Paul says, do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him, you can't be buried by a sprinkle, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
See the significance here? When we go into the water, we're saying, Lord, I accept your death for me on the cross. I want my old way of life to be, to be dead and buried. And I want to live a new life in Christ. See, this is how we honor the, uh, the resurrection. This is the, the symbol of the resurrection. There is a symbol for the resurrection that we take with us. This is it. So baptism, let's, let's uh, go through here. What are we learning about baptism? Number one, dying to the old sinful way of life. You think back, maybe there's something that happened in my life. Maybe a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, long time ago. Maybe it still haunts me today. Something that troubles me. When we walk into that watery grave of baptism, we get to die to all those sins of the past. Dying to the guilt of the past, to the condemnation. Everything in the past is cleansed. So we bury those sins in the watery grave. Now, granted, this is symbolic, but this is, this is the, the meaning of this symbolism. And somebody may say, well, wait a minute, doesn't God forgive me every time I confess my sins? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. Of course He does, the Bible says so. But, look, maybe you still remember every sin you've committed in your past life, and maybe you don't. When we walk into the watery grave of baptism, we're saying, God, I give you my whole self, everything I've done, everything I've done wrong, every part of my life, the things I can't remember. All of it. Lord, just count my whole past life dead and gone. My whole life of sin. I'm going to go under the water. Everything will be cleansed whether I confess it, whether I can remember it or not. And I'm going to come up a new man, a new woman in Christ. I'm going to start with a new slate and begin a new life. So here we see baptism, dying to the old sinful way of life, burying our sins in the water, rising up again out of the water to walk a new life. It's one thing to have a new car, a new suit, a new dress, a new pair of shoes. But what about a new life? See, we can walk into the water and the old life be gone forever. Have a clean slate before the judgment bar in heaven. Rising up out of the water to walk in a new life. See, this is the symbol of the resurrection. Coming up out of that water. See, the Bible says that, that Sunday, or the first day of the week, that's, that's not the symbol of the resurrection. Baptism is the symbol. This is the symbol. Jesus' resurrection is profoundly significant. We, we base our hope and faith and trust in God. The fact that Jesus is raised life, we believe it. And this is the symbol that comes out of that. We come up out of the water with the Spirit filling our lives to give us a new life in Christ. Smiling, happy, cheerful, rejoicing in Jesus. Now friends, let's be clear. Baptism doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But it does mean that you're committed. You're committed. Somebody may say, well... I want to, maybe I should wait until I'm perfect, or at least until I get a little better, before I'm baptized. But friends, if, if that's our thinking, we'll never move ahead. See, baptism doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we're committed. And baptism is not the end of the Christian life. Oh no, it's just the beginning. Baptism gives us a new sense of direction. We say, God, I am yours completely. My old self is dead New life with you, Jesus. Baptism gives us a new sense of freedom. Because remember, that old self, some people think that's freedom, but the old self is actually the self that leads you into all those problems, that sinful life that you can't seem to get away from. I want that old life to be dead. Baptism gives us this new sense of freedom, a new sense of spiritual power in our lives. So what exactly happens when we're baptized, every sin is forgiven. That's Acts 2.38. Here it is. Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice what he said. 
How many should be baptized? Everyone. Everyone. Now, someone may say, wait a minute, what about that thief on the cross? He was never baptized. Now, friends, tell me something, though. If the thief had lived, what would he have done next? He would have gone to be baptized. The Bible says baptism is for everyone, not just a select few. We're all sinners. We all need to be baptized. The Holy Spirit empowers us. So here we are. Every sin is forgiven, and the Holy Spirit is given to us. Here's Mark 1.10. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And Peter said to them, Acts 2, 38 and 39, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, friends, the good news for you, for all of us, is that God has a gift for us. When we're baptized, we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter went on to say, The promise is to you and your children to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And we know that God's calling everyone. See, when God calls you to baptism and you're cleansed, He promises you the gift of the Spirit to empower your new life. Now, isn't that gracious of God? Your old life is dead. You have a new life. God doesn't just leave you hanging. He says, and now here's the power to live that new life. So what happens when we're baptized? Every sin forgiven. The Spirit is given. We're adopted into God's family. Acts 2.41, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls, 3,000 people added to the church. When we're baptized, we're gladly receiving God's word. Just like in this series. As, as I've presented this, as we've, we've shared in this series, we're all together receiving God's Word, gladly receiving it. We're le learning new things. We're learning something about God's plan for the world and for the future and also God's plan for me. And at some point, as we go through the series, we, you know, maybe... Maybe this is something new, something that I want to take a stand for. Maybe this has become personal. Maybe the Spirit of God is, is speaking to your heart and calling you to follow Him in this way. Here it is, Acts 2.41, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. See, people may say, well, uh, but when I accept Jesus and when I'm baptized, do I become part of a church? Look what it says. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The answer is yes. And friends, I've had people ask me this. I hear even not so long ago. Well, why is that important? Listen, just as a practical matter, and you can read this elsewhere in the scripture, the, the Christian believers are described as a body and we need each other. You need to, we all need to be in a family of believers. And this is why... As, as Adventists, when we practice baptism, we're baptizing into Jesus and into a body of believers at the same time. Become part of God's body of believers, His Sabbath-keeping, commandment-keeping, people who are looking forward to the second coming, that's what Adventist means, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. Just like it says here, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, See, we want, a, we, want a, we want a group of believers that, that believe and trust the Bible like we do. We want a church that's in harmony with God's teachings. And we want to be part of that kind of fellowship. So when we're baptized, our sins are forgiven, life's cleansed, we receive the Holy Spirit, become part of a, a worldwide fellowship, just like it says in Revelation, keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. A fellowship, and there are believers like this all around the world, God's end time people, an international community of faith. And you know, God is leading people from all over the world, different 
ethnic, religious persuasions to be part of his last day people. Gathering to, together into one final worldwide commandment keeping, Sabbath loving, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, a movement of people. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have been made to drink of one spirit. So we come together in the body of Christ. Holy Spirit's leading men and women today to know Jesus, to know Christ, know His truth, and to follow Him all the way, all the way. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, but now indeed there are many members, but one body. And friends, this is happening today. God is leading many members of, from different backgrounds, different faiths, even different denominations to come together, follow Him in, bapti in baptism, and and join like-minded believers looking forward to Jesus coming. Faithful to the commandments. Faithful to everything God's revealed to us in His Word, as we've seen through the series. You say, well, what steps should a person take before being baptized? Well, here's what we know. Repent. Have a genuine sorrow for sin. We say, Lord, I, I believe that you can forgive my sins. You alone are my Savior. You alone can give me power to, do, to be a new man or a new woman. So if we, we take this first step on our faith journey, and that's repentance. Now, it's not being sorry for the consequences. It's being sorry enough for my, th th this way of life that's been so hurtful and damaging to myself and everyone else that I really want to leave it behind. It means my attitude toward this life of being separated from God, my attitude toward that has radically changed. So here we have, we repent. Then number two, we believe an acceptance of Jesus as both Savior and Lord. We repent of our sin. We believe that Jesus Christ is the one who saves us. And here's number three. We learn... Receive instruction in the essentials of biblical faith. And that's one of the things that we're doing here together. And, and, and by the way, let's be clear. This is a two-way street. Okay? As we're, we're sharing together, we're all learning. Just like this. We open the Bible together, the Bible speaks to both of us. And we understand basic truths of the Bible, the essential truths of His Word... And as we do, God invites us to make a decision to take a stand and be baptized and join believers who share those things in common. You know, during this series, maybe you have seen some things that are new, are different. Maybe God's speaking to your heart that you want to be baptized into this, this new understanding of, of God's Word. Now, you may say, well, but I have been baptized. I have been baptized Completely, just like you described. Well, should a person ever be rebaptized? Well, there, there is, there is a case for that. Here it is. There was an instance in the Bible where people were rebaptized. The Apostle Paul's preaching on the upper coast of Ephesus, and a group of people came to him, and he said to them, "Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed?" And they said to him. We haven't heard so much that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, well, what were you baptized into? John's baptism. And, and that was a full baptism by immersion. Remember, that was the baptism that Jesus experienced. But this is after the Jesus ministry. This is after Jesus has died on the cross and buried in the tomb and resurrected on the third day. This is after Pentecost. This is after all of that. There's more now. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ. And when they heard this, they heard, they said, oh, we didn't know the Messiah had come. We knew that John was telling us he was coming. We didn't know that yet. 
And when they heard that, and Paul shares with them more about Jesus, they said, yes, we want to be baptized into the Lord Jesus. And they were. The group was baptized by immersion by John and rebaptized by immersion by Paul. Why? Why? Because they discovered more truth. And it's pretty significant truth. The truth they discovered about the Holy Spirit was at the heart of the Christian faith. They wanted to walk in all the light of God's Word. So here's a couple reasons. <clears throat> excuse me. Here's a couple reasons we might consider rebaptism. If perhaps once we were baptized and then we wandered away from Jesus, you know that happens. But now we say, I, Lord, I'm coming home. Maybe remember that good gospel song. I've wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home. One of my favorites. Number two, maybe we've committed our life to Jesus, but now we've discovered the truth of God's Word, and we want to be, you know, we, we've discovered something more than we, we've seen before. Something new. And it's significant enough that we want to take a public stand and say, I want to, I want to, Proclaim my loyalty to Jesus in this new truth that I have heard. Now, we, you don't have to be rebaptized. If you've been baptized by immersion, you don't have to be rebaptized, but you may if you would like. If God stirs your heart, we're certainly not going to hold you back. We'd say, Come, if God's calling you. Just like John's disciples who had seen, they had truth, they did. But then they heard more truth. And they move forward. If we're Christians and we're going into the water to be rebaptized, it doesn't mean we're denying our Christian experience. Oh no. John's bapt uh, disciples were baptized, not be they weren't denying their previous experience, they were denying the teaching of John. What they're saying is we've learned something more, something greater. We've learned new truth about Jesus. We want to move ahead. We want this new truth that God has given us. We want to show that we're completely committed to it. And if that's, if that's your experience, then you can, you can do the same thing that, that they did. And we say, well, how important is baptism? Why are we spending so much time talking about baptism? Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Listen to this story. Listen to this story. A young man named Peter lived in Poland. He was, he was an angry young man. Here, here he is on the right-hand side. He was a Polish, now this is really an oxymoron, he was a Polish neo-Nazi. Tough kid. He became involved actually in the occult, in Satan worship. Wanted nothing to do with Christianity, but then he got brain cancer. Neurosurgeon operated on his brain, but was not able to get all the cancer. Peter began wasting away, his skin turned yellow. Peter's Christian mother would take Christian audio tapes home from a lecture series she was listening to. It was a series very similar to this. Very similar. And then she would let Peter listen to them. And after a while, his heart was touched, and he said, I want to give my life to Jesus. He took all his Nazi materials, all his satanic materials, and threw them away. And the pastor who's doing this series, Pastor Mark Finley, visited Peter and opened the Bible with him, studied the Bible with him, one day, his mother called and said, Pastor, you've got to come quickly. The doctor's here. Peter's dying. He's only going to live two more hours. So Pastor Finley goes to the house, finds Peter in terrible shape. He's vomiting. Hasn't been able to keep food down for three weeks. Pastor Finley says, I remember getting a basin and holding it and holding Peter so he could keep vomiting. All he could do was hold him Peter looked up into his eyes and he said, Pastor, you've got to baptize me before I die. 
And, the, and Mark Finley, the pastor, he said, look, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized because he wasn't physically able. Neither are you. I can't take you to the church. I can't take you down to the river. He said, pastor, please baptize me. It's, it's the wish of a dying boy. I want to be baptized. So Pastor Finley took his Bible, read him the text of God's assurance and his love. And they talked about baptism. And as he began to read to him about baptism itself, Peter said, Pastor, please, please baptize me. So Pastor Finley said to his mother, he said, fill up the bathtub with water. Fill it up as high as you can. I'm going to baptize him in the bathtub. And he said to Peter, strip, strip down to your waist. Peter starts to vomit again. Pastor Finley holds him and then holds a bowl so he can keep vomiting. And then he says, the doctor's there. The doctor says, he's going to die. Pastor takes him in his arms and walks him into the bathroom. He kneels on the floor with this frail, dying boy in his arms. Lays him in, in the bathtub with the water. Lifts his hand to heaven. Peter, I now baptize you. Because you love Jesus with all your heart, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Then he took him down under the water and lifted him up out of the water. And a beautiful smile comes to Peter's face. He said, oh, Pastor, my, my sins are forgiven. It was as if that was a holy place. The presence of God was there. The boy's heart was touched. His life was filled with a deep sense of God's presence and his peace. Pastor hugged him, brought him back to his chair. Peter's mother dries him off. He said, Mother, I want some tea. And do you know, Peter did not die that day. He didn't die the next day or the next. God gave him another month. And his mother told Pastor Finley later that this was the happiest month of his life. She said every night they read the Bible together, sang hymns together, prayed together. And at the end of a month, he was lying in bed one day. He just closed his eyes and went to sleep in Jesus. Listen to this. This is the message from a dying boy. There's no reason to wait. Move ahead. Follow Jesus. Be baptized. Be the happiest day of your life. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.2, Behold, now, now is the day, the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Friends, there's no need to wait now is the day to seal your heart. Now is the day to say, Lord, I want all my sins to be forgiven. I want to be cleansed. And I want to, to experience this symbol of, of cleansing and a new life with you. This is the day to say, I, I want to look forward to baptism and the, and the Holy Spirit filling my life. I want to join men and women around the world that John describes in Revelation. This remnant people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And in Revelation 14, 4, it says, This special group of people, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes, and the Lamb was baptized, and that's why I'm baptized. Follow Jesus wherever He goes. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on His name. Words actually spoken to Paul when he first came to faith. So, here it says in Revelation 7, 14, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. We saw this when we, last week, we looked at the plagues. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So what is the symbol? What's the symbol we're talking about here? Baptism. Baptism. These are the people, these are those people saved in God's kingdom. They stand for Christ today so they can stand for Him when He comes. John goes on to say, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. They serve Him up there. 
because they've had the courage to stand for him down here. They worship him up there because they stepped out for him down here. All over the world, men and women are taking a courageous stand for Christ in baptism. Here, here's one example in the Philippines. And again, I, we really need the lights to be lower to be able to see this. Needed a brighter projector. They say that here in Manila, in this large stadium, 40 vehicles had to transport all the baptismal candidates to the site. And on this beautiful afternoon, 1,300 people gave their lives to Jesus. examples of some people in other places. Hmm. Also in India, a land where traditionally for many, many years, Christianity very hard to penetrate the Hindu culture. But they are also coming to Jesus, being baptized. And actually this is Mark Finley is, is one of the gentlemen standing up there. There he is. There's Pastor Kidman who told the story. Hmm. Perhaps you sense that God's calling you for a decision tonight. This is, this is a, an absolutely personal decision. It is, no question about it. But I just want to encourage you, if God is calling you to take this step in as a symbol of your complete commitment to Him, hmm, I just encourage you, say yes to Jesus. Now just join me as we, as we pray right now. Heavenly Father, Perhaps before this evening when we thought about baptism, yes, it was significant. But even as I, even as I present this, I'm reminded of the significance of the very act of being baptized. The death to our old life. The burial, the complete burial in the watery grave. And being lifted up by another hand to this new life and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't just call us to leave our old lives behind. You don't call us just to die to self. You don't call us just to go under the water and to come back up, but you also give us the power, the Holy Spirit power, to live this new life in victory. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for this symbol teaching us so much. And Lord, if, if you are calling, if you are calling us tonight to be baptized for the first time, or perhaps re-baptized, Lord, we just pray that it would be so clear to us that that is your voice calling us to do that. And Lord, perhaps maybe this evening you're also calling us to think back on our baptism to think back and to thank you for the wonderful truth. To thank you for bringing us into your truth. Lord, whatever our experience is, we just thank you for the symbol, the symbol of the death and resurrection of the new life. And we want to know the power of the resurrection, just as the Apostle Paul said, to know the power of a resurrected Jesus. Lord, let that be our experience, not only tonight, but always, until Jesus comes. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen.